Hey everyone, welcome back to Nintendo Prime. We got a bevy of news stories for you today, including some really interesting news on a massive franchise that Microsoft wants to bring to Nintendo Switch, of all things. Uh, and yeah, some updates on Xenoblade Chronicles 3, updates on a specific lawsuit that Nintendo's been involved in, and so much more. Now, before we get into it, I will remind you, we are giving away a Nintendo Switch OLED, a PlayStation 5, or an Xbox Series X to one lucky winner. All you have to do is go to the gleam.io link down in the description or pinned comment to enter, and I wish everyone luck. So our first story is actually dealing with Kit and Krista. Uh, if you remember who Kit and Krista are or aren't aware, uh, they used to run Nintendo Minute for the official Nintendo YouTube channel. It was a nice little show. They would interview people sometimes, give opinions. It was basically a sort of fluff show for Nintendo uh, that tried to connect with fans. And they did that show for about, I don't know, 10, 13 years. They were doing it for a long time. Uh, both Kit and Krista have left Nintendo after Nintendo closed their uh, California office so now the only office for nintendo america now uh besides obviously retro studios exist in redmond washington and they were given the option to move to redmond washington and they didn't have to end nintendo minute but they decided hey our family our friends everyone's here we're not leaving that well they have decided to return with their own podcast called the kit and krista podcast i will put a link to their youtube channel for it down below they also have a patreon as well for it. you guys can Check all the details out on it if you want. Their plan for this podcast, we have no idea how long the episodes are going to be or if they're going to do interviews in this podcast, but they are going to be talking about stories that they were unable to talk about on Nintendo Minute that they have experienced over the last 13 to 14 years. Uh, they're going to do a classic Nintendo Minute segment in each podcast as well and then dive into other things in gaming news and in the industry because they obviously have a lot of thoughts on things that isn't just Nintendo. Uh, so I think it's going to be really interesting to see what, how this podcast evolves and how successful it can be because these are obviously two former Nintendo employees that have a decent following uh, trying to you know, spin off and do their own thing. They're basically trying to keep it going without having to leave where they are. So I, I give them credit for that and I do hope that it all works out for them. Next up, a massive IP is for sale. This is the type of sale we don't see very often and that would be the Lord of the Rings. So the Saul uh, Zantz company has decided to sell its holdings in the Tolkien uh, which is expected to fetch around $2 billion at auction. Now, Amazon supposedly in talks with this, along with several other companies potentially in talks as well. And this does include the movie and video game rights. This won't affect Gollum that's scheduled to come out later this year, as that's a pre-existing contract and is supposed to come to Nintendo Switch. But it could impact several other things coming down the line. Uh, right now, uh, the movie rights are even up for grabs, because despite a different studio handling the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit movies, they haven't done an anything film-wise in a while, so they've sort of lost their movie rights back to the default, and the Saul Zanis company owns a majority of Tolkien Holdings. So it's really interesting to see uh, who ends up with the rights for the TV, movies, video games, stuff like that. I wouldn't be surprised if Disney's maybe in talks as well, although um, we'll see if that's even something the F CC would approve after they've obviously got their hands on Marvel and Fox, but we'll have to wait and see how it all turns out. But for right now, it is up for sale. I don't think we need to think Nintendo's probably going to get involved in this. It's too much money for Nintendo to consider for a single IP, but hey, we'll see what happens down the line. Next up, we have brand new details for Xenoblade Chronicles 3, uh, courtesy of the game's director, Tetsuya Takahashi. So let's just jump right into everything he said because it's quite long. Just over four years since the release of Xenoblade Chronicles 2 and one and a half years since the release of Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition, we now bring you news regarding the latest game from Monolith Soft, Xenoblade Chronicles 3. As the name indicates, it is the third installment in the Xenoblade Chronicles series. We are currently making the final adjustments to ensure we make it the best game possible. Based on everything we've learned from the past games from the series, the key visual features a broken greatsword of Machanus and the body of Uriana Titan with big gaping hole. I imagine everyone who saw the trailer was quite surprised by the final scene. What is this visual hinting at? I can't reveal that yet. What I can tell you is this visual was conceived quite some time ago. More precisely speaking, we came up with it sometime between the end of development of Xenoblade Chronicles and the beginning of development of Xenoblade Chronicles 2. So it's not something we recently added to the series. We believe the game will be enjoyable for both those who have played Xenoblade Chronicles and or Xenoblade Chronicles 2, as well as those who will be playing Xenoblade Chronicles game for the first time. The characters were designed by Matsuyuga Sato, who also designed the characters for Xenoblade Chronicles 2. 
While we can't show them to you at this time, Kachi Magutani created some of the key artworks. As you can see, familiar staff members to the Xenoblade Chronicles series have once again come together to create this game. The game music was also handled by artists who have contributed to the series in the past. The music for Xenoblade Chronicles 3 was composed by Yasumori Mitsuda, Manami Kayata, Ace, Toma Kuda, Chiko, Kenji, Hiramatsu, and Mariam Abunser. The music in this game uh, maintains a unique Xenoblade Chronicles touch while also taking on a new challenge, namely that of integrating as its motif a flute-based melody. The flute is actually one of the key themes in this game. A variety of other elements and themes are hidden in the trailer. We'll be revealing the details bit by bit going forward. Xenoblade Chronicles 3 is a brand new adventure, bringing together the worlds of Xenoblade Chronicles and Xenoblade Chronicles 2 to take the players into the future. While there is still some time left before the release of the game, please look forward to it. Um, and obviously this is going to build a lot of hype for Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Uh, they did reveal a ton of details of Xenoblade Chronicles 2 heading into launch, so I expect them to do the same here. It looks like they're going to be drip feeding through these blog posts, maybe press releases, obviously trailers and all that as well, all the way up to release. Um, yeah, I don't know if this is going to be the final installment. Uh, this, you know, Monolith Soft tends to do like a three game installment. Uh, technically, we would be fourth games with Xenoblade Chronicles X, which was a spinoff. I'm not sure what we consider that. But yeah, um, we'll see if this is the last Xenoblade Chronicles game there is. But I do expect this to be the end of the current chapter of Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and 2. So um, this is going to be this is going to be a great way to see how they want to end this story. So next up, we have the conclusion of a lawsuit uh, with the government and Nintendo against Team Executor Hacker extraordinaire Gary Bowser. Last we talked about this, the update was that the federal government was trying to get five years imprisonment against uh, Gary Bowser to set an example that this sort of behavior, stealing games, hacking products like this uh, is frowned upon and definitely illegal. Well, they did not get their five year wish, but they did get 40 months. Gary Bowser has been officially um, put in jail now for 40 months, which is just over three years. Uh, you got to let me know if you think this is a fair punishment. Remember, he already owes $15 million worth of fines. Uh, he owes $5 million to Nintendo and $10 million, no, wait, no, $5 million to the government in fines, $10 million to Nintendo in damages. So uh, let me know if you think this is, is fair. The two other cohorts of Team Executor um, right now are not um, in custody. Uh, they have a bunch of pending lawsuits against them as well. So maybe we'll have more updates on this story down the line. But you guys let me know what you think about this. Was this a just and fair punishment? Do you think it's too much? Uh, do you think it's not enough? I mean, that's that's a, a valid thought process as well. Next up, I want to tell you guys that all of the big games or seemingly all the big games from yesterday's Nintendo Direct are now up for physical pre-order at many retail outlets. Not all of them have it up. Uh, the one that we're going to talk about ourselves is just one because we, we have a special deal going on between Nintendo and Best Buy at the moment, where if you use our affiliate link, we actually get a 14% kickback on your pre-orders or really any purchase you buy for Switch. So down in the description or the pinned comment, we're actually going to put up all of the affiliate links uh, for the Best Buy uh, physical versions of uh, all of the big games yesterday from Nintendo Switch Sports, the Splatoon 3, Kirby, etc. All the big ones are up there. Mario Strikers, the new Fire Emblem Warriors game, they're all there. So if you were looking to buy those games anyways, Obviously, we encourage you to use our affiliate links and help support the channel without, hey, you're not donating. You're just you're something you were going to buy anyway. So why not give us a small kickback? Obviously, you don't have to use our affiliate links. You can go ahead and pre-order at your favorite retail outlets. I'm sure Amazon has them up, Target, GameStop, etc. as well. Um, but we're just going to link to our affiliate link because, hey, you know what? Why not try to support our channel? I don't know. You guys, you guys can literally. <laughs> I, am I begging you to? Nate! Don't do this. Don't be begging people to use your I don't care. Get the game wherever you want, guys. Buy it on the eShop. In fact, Nintendo Switch Sports is cheaper digitally than physically. Physically, you get the leg strap. Digitally, you don't. So they're only charging you 40. So, I mean, if you don't care about the leg strap, technically, you should just buy it digitally. But hey, you know what? Some people need that physical cart. And our final story is a bit of an interesting one. Um, this was something that kind of slipped under the radar yesterday. And we had a Nintendo Direct, so we weren't really going to talk about this yesterday. But Phil Spencer... Uh, put out an interesting update on their purchasing acquisition of Activision Blizzard and their intense 
moving forward with games, uh, especially major IPs like Call of Duty. And what's interesting isn't so much that he's, you know, basically reassuring that beyond currently existing contracts, they plan to bring Call of Duty as an example to PlayStation and stuff moving forward. It's comments he made that specifically applies to Nintendo Switch that I find most interesting since Activision Blizzard hasn't exactly been the greatest supporter of Switch. We did get Overwatch. We have gotten like, you know, Crash and Spyro, but we, we don't get the big IPs. Although, I mean, yeah, Overwatch is pretty big and we're supposed to get Overwatch too, but in general, we don't get their biggest IPs on Switch. Uh, and that might be changing because Phil Spencer said something that I thought was really shocking. We'd like to bring Call of Duty to Nintendo devices. We'd like to bring other popular titles that Activision Blizzard has and ensure that they continue to be available on PlayStation and that they become available on Nintendo. Namely, invest more in innovation, bring it to more people, bring it to more platforms, make it even more useful and hopefully delightful for the people who, who use it. Now, obviously, the PlayStation stuff is just maintaining current uh, current ways that Activision Blizzard works. But the idea that they want to bring Call of Duty to Nintendo and other big Activision Blizzard you know, games to Nintendo as well. I find that to be utterly fascinating because again, Activision Blizzard has basically been avoiding Nintendo like the plague. But was that because Bobby Kotick was making those decisions and he was the one deciding Nintendo Switch wasn't worth investing in, whereas Phil Spencer has raw sales data of things like Cuphead to look at, things like Ori to look at, and probably realizes there's a really big untapped audience on Switch for these games, so why the hell are we avoiding them? And it sounds like under Microsoft's tutelage, Activision Blizzard might be actually getting better at being multi-platform instead of becoming more inclusive to Microsoft, at least for the really big IPs. Uh, so I find that to be really interesting that, at least according to Phil Spencer, his goal is to get Activision Blizzard to bring Call of Duty and all their other big IPs to Nintendo Switch or future Nintendo platforms. That to me is exciting and a very interesting twist of fate here. Obviously, there's a lot of just trying to get the sale approved by the FCC and minds can change down the line. And I do expect certain Activision Blizzard games to eventually be exclusive to Xbox Game Pass platforms. But I do think the, they might see a benefit in Call of Duty the same way they did with Minecraft uh, to keep it a multi-platform experience. And if that's the case, hey, if we're going to keep Call of Duty always infinitely multi-platform, then why the hell don't we put this on Switch? I don't know why Microsoft um, is going this way, but I'm really happy about it. And I think they just see untapped sales potential that Call of Duty could bring the Switch because there's not really a lot of games military shooter wise that would compete with it. I, mean, I, I don't know. It just makes a lot of sense. They brought Call of Duty Black Ops to literally the Wii U and that plat platform flopped. So why the hell not bring it to Switch? I understand downgrades and all that. Who cares, right? Fortnite's massively successful on here. Every game that's basically come over has been massively successful. So, hey, you know what, Phil? I like where you're going with this and I really, really hope that you stick to your guns and, and get Activision Blizzard to deliver a high quality Call of Duty port to Switch. All right, folks, I am Nintendo Rubble Jans from Nintendo Prime. I want to thank you guys so much for tuning in. It's been a lot of fun today, and I'll catch you in the next video.